Good morning then. Good morning. Well, good morning now. I'm always uh, slightly wary. When you, when it's, it's, it's nice when you're invited back somewhere, but sometimes I feel it's kind of, you know, like when you're invited back the second time to apologize. You know, so uh, hopefully that's not the case, but it is lovely to be with you here in, in, in First Church in Belfast to worship with you. Um, I want to uh, just open our service with a, with a call to worship. Children of God, welcome here. Welcome to this place of love and grace. Welcome to this place of, of hope and perseverance. Our God invites all of us to be part of the beloved community. God invites all of us to share in the good news. For we are welcome just as we are. We are loved just as we are. In gratitude for all this, we gather here. So let us worship our God. Amen. I want to invite you to, to stand if you can. And don't worry if you can't. Uh, but we're going to, uh, to sing together. And we're going to sing our, our opening praise. Let me just make sure I have it right. Uh, oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Let's worship God together. It's number 21 in the, in, in the Red Book. seats and I want to invite David to come and bring to us our first reading this morning. David, thank you. 
Thank you, Jen. When I was growing up in an evangelical church, there used to be a phrase when people were doing something that other people thought was wrong, and they would say, may the Lord convict you, in other words, that, you know, that somehow the Lord would let you know what you were doing wasn't right. And funny, this phrase came back to me when I read a thing on a progressive Christian website that I'm going to share with you in a minute. And it's something that we as Christians need to think about because it's how we can be shown up by other folk by not doing what they're doing for entirely different reasons. Here's the piece. A great rabbi was once asked, why did God create atheists? The rabbi said, atheists are the most important example for all who believe in God. When an atheist is moral and good and kind and compassionate, it's not because he believes God commanded him to be so, nor because he fears any kind of punishment for being bad. An atheist performs acts of righteousness because he knows it is right to do. And where is God in this? If he is in the atheist's heart or guiding him, it doesn't matter. The atheist helps regardless. He helps because he believes there is nobody else, no power that can or will act without his own deeds. So when someone is in need, in our times of crisis, you shouldn't say, oh, I'll pray for you, or may God help you. Rather, in this moment, you should be as an atheist. Believe there is no God who can help and say, I will help you. In this way, the atheist is closest to God, and so must we be as well. Amen.
Thank you, Richard. That was lovely. Really enjoyed that. And thank you, David, for reading to us this morning. I want to read once more. And uh, we're, I'm going to turn to uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. Uh, one of my favorite little, uh, little um, parables that Jesus told. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said to them, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice, and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I want you to, uh, um, I want you to engage your imagination this morning, because I want you to place yourself uh, as far as you can, into the, the scene of this parable. I want you to imagine that, uh, imagine your frustration, your profound sense of, of injustice at the way that you've been treated. Your adversary, your, your enemy, maybe, uh, maybe a rich businessman or, or perhaps some... Uh, um, faceless bureaucratic corporation, perhaps even the government itself, has simply acted as if you were beneath their concern. And the truth is, you are you're off to a bad start, because in the in the the, the world of of Jesus' uh, earthly ministry, women were not best placed to bring any kind of a claim, any kind of a, of, a, of a plea before the courts. You're utterly powerless to challenge them. You have little in the way of, uh, of, of uh, legal right that you can depend on. Your only hope lies in obtaining a judgment in your favour from one of the local county courts. But again, as a, a woman, especially as a poor woman, you're ill-placed to represent yourself in any court with any chance of success. You wouldn't have had uh, an education. Uh, you wouldn't have experience. This is, would not be your world that you were entering into. And then, to make matters worse, you look up at the, uh, um, at the judge and you, your heart sinks because you realize, oh, please, not him. Because this guy has a reputation. He has a reputation for, for not being someone who fears God and not being someone who cares about men. In, in, in the very simplest terms, it sounds like he's maybe in it for the money. He's certainly in it for more to do with, with himself than the people who come before him. He's known to be uh, maybe open to offers, shall we say? Others might, might say uh, less, less uh, um, others who, who put things less delicately might say he was known to be on the take. Even to receive a hearing in his court is usually it's usually known that you might have to slip a little bit of uh, of extra grease to the uh, to the to, to to the clerk of the court, who actually because they take their cue from the judge, they're just as bad as the judge. 
And uh, again, remember that you are a woman of very limited means. You don't have the wherewithal to pay bribes. But you've nowhere else to go, no other option, if you are to have any hope of receiving justice, of receiving a hearing, even. So you do what you have to do, and you go to court, and, and as soon as you explain, you obviously have to begin by explaining to the clerks of the court uh, that you have no money to pay the, uh, the expected bribes. And even as you walk up to them, you can see them rubbing their hands with glee and, and practically holding their hand out with a, with a uh, where's my cut kind of a look. And, and, and they, when they hear that you have no money, their response is, well, frankly, they just laugh in your face. And they send you to sit back, sit at the back of the court, and they say, well, you, you, you may as well just sit back down there and get yourself comfortable because you'll not be going anywhere very quickly. And you wait. And then you wait some more. And then you begin to see that others who have come in after you are having their cases dealt with. You see wads of, of, uh, of, of money uh, changing hands. Fat envelopes may be passed up to the judge. The whole day passes and everyone is seen but you. And then suddenly the court is just dismissed and you're told to go home. But you are determined. You will not be beaten back by this. And the next day, there you are again. And the clerks again inquire about their fees, thinking maybe she's gone and, and borrowed some. Maybe she's, maybe she's got a, an, an aunt or an uncle or somebody that, that's, that, that's given her. And again, they come up to her with their hands eagerly stretched out. And again, they laugh when you explain, no, you still don't have any money to pay them. And once again, they send you to the back of the room and you explain, when you explain that that's the situation. You're clearly becoming something of a running joke. Other plaintiffs are brought in. Again, there are nods and winks and shakes of the head and sly smiles. And, and you, can, you can see a, a hand held out, just, just out of sight, but you can just catch it. By the third day, you're getting uh, increasingly irked. And you've decided to yourself, every time there's a break, every time there's a breath, every time there's a pause in this court, you will make yourself heard and you begin to cry out. You begin to, to, to say loudly, some would say embarrassingly loudly. You begin to say, have mercy on me. And everyone in the court looks in your direction. But nothing happens. And then the next pause in proceedings comes and you cry out again, have mercy, have mercy on me. I just want justice. All I want is to be heard. Please give me, give me justice. And more and more people are getting angry. The clerks are looking very upset. The judge himself is glaring at the clerks because it's their job to deal with this. But this, you, uh, one of the, one of the, the, the small protections that you have as a woman, as a widow, is that no one is, a, is permitted to strike you in public. So nothing is done and you're allowed to come and go and continue. And again, every time there's a break, every time the judge so much as sniffs and stands and there's a pause, Lord, have mercy. I just want justice. Just give me justice. And the judge keeps trying to ignore her. He takes a few more cases up to lunch. But you are persistent. You are dogged. You are determined. You will not give up. And you know justice is on your side, but you need to be heard. And you cry out, justice. Justice for the widow. Justice for the weak. Justice for the poor. 
And eventually the judge's head is just swimming. You know how, you know how it would be. He's just kind of getting to himself, oh, for pity's sake, that woman, I, she's going to do my head in. And he calls over the clerk and he says, what is that woman on about? What is she looking at? What does she want from me? And the clerk, you know, brings her over and finds out what it is and he explains to the judge and the, and the, and the judge eventually he calls you forward and he deals just, justly with your case. And just like that widow, that's, the, that's, that's Jesus' story. That, that's the, the story that he presents. And, we're, and, and the Bible tells us he presents it so that we would learn to pray and not give up. However, the problem, there is a problem with this, with this story. You can come away from it thinking that God is like that judge. You can come away thinking that God is, uh, is not interested in your voice. You can come away thinking that he is not interested in your plea, in your case, in your despair, in your hopelessness, in your, in your loss. But that's not who God is. That's not actually who our loving God is is look again at that that little passage will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night will he keep putting them off and obviously the implied answer is well no of course our God will not keep putting people off Verse 8, I tell you, he will see they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And then there's another little passage earlier in Luke, Luke chapter 6. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. But if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, is that any credit to you? Sure, even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting anything back. And then your reward will be great. You will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Well, now we're getting a clue what God's character is. God's character is rooted in generosity. God's character is determined to show mercy. And he is anxious about justice for those who are exploited, those who are excluded, those who are turned away. Those who want to plea to God and yet they find that at the door at the, there are gatekeepers who are telling them, no, there's no place for you here. But the judge hears and the judge is the judge who's Watchword is mercy. God does not ignore us. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, I will never leave you and neither will I ever forsake you. You can feel sometimes that you're alone and isolated and that nobody hears and nobody cares. But God will tell you today and does tell you today, I hear I know. I will walk through these shadows with you. I will never leave you or abandon you. I am with you in the middle of the shadow, in the deepest darkness, 
We're back to that old familiar psalm. I'm sure you hear it rattling round the back of your head just as I speak there. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. God would say to you today, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I'll shine a light on your path and I'll walk with you through the deepest darkness. Matthew 6 and 8 says, Your Father knows what you need even before you ask him. Ephesians 2 and 4, Because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead. It is by grace you have been saved. And yet we are called to demonstrate that persistence, that willingness to keep coming, that willingness to keep asking, that willingness to keep saying, Lord, hear me. But we do so knowing that we don't pray into the air, that we don't just pray into the gap. We pray to this God who hears, this God who listens. Even in that act of prayer, we draw ourselves close to who God is. There is something powerfully significant in achieving God's purposes in the, in the world and in the kingdom of God about a heart that is willing consistently to come before God and say, God, I am here. And to hear him in return say, I am also here with you. God's will is to undertake those actions that are directly and especially for our benefit because we are called to be part of his family. Equally, it's his will to reach those who don't yet know of his love. And our place is to tell them that wonderfully, unexpectedly, profoundly, deeply, gloriously. God is for them and not against them. That his mercy never ends and his justice never fails. And he is love. Let's turn to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Almighty God, Lord, we do thank you for that great and never-ending love that never stops seeking us out, that never fades and never lets us go. We thank you for your care that we experience every moment of every day, for everything you've done for us and for all the world through Christ. We pray today, Lord, for all those who feel desperate today, all those who feel lonely, unloved, unwanted. Lord, in your mercy, reach out in love. We pray for all those whose relationships have been broken, whether through separation or divorce or bereavement. We pray for those who've never enjoyed the relationships they might have had. We pray, Lord, for children rejected by their parents or by family members. We pray for parents alienated from their children. We pray for family members estranged from one another. Lord, we ask that in your mercy you would reach out there in love. Today, Lord, we pray for individuals who feel rejected by society, those who have no confidence in their abilities, no place where they feel accepted, no recognition of their own worth. Once again, Lord, in your mercy, reach out in love. Lord, we pray for our community and other communities like it, which are divided by prejudice or race or religion. We pray, Lord, for the disagreement and tension and disharmony that there is even within the churches. And we pray, Lord, for, for those nations that are currently broken by war and violence. 
Lord, in your mercy, reach out in love. Almighty God, we pray that you would bring friendship to the lonely, reconciliation to the estranged, harmony to the divided, and comfort to the bereaved. In our homes, in our families, our schools, our places of work, our country, in our world, may your love be shared gloriously among us, helping us to to be a people who bring hope and healing. Lord, in your mercy, reach out in love. For we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. I'm going to stand and sing again. And uh, let me get my my wee list of hymns out. These are all cracking hymns this morning. Uh, 259, let's sing Jesus good above all others. myself in a bit of a quandary because I prayed when I shouldn't have prayed because we should have had a hymn and then a prayer and then a hymn so uh, um, being being a a deep dye democrat um, I think uh, we'll we'll put it to a vote Um, I I can pray again and 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 then sing again or we can just go since I prayed already we can just go straight to uh, as it were to, to 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 another hymn and uh, and we don't want to, we don't want to miss that because it's uh, guide me with our great Jehovah. So uh, all those who want to plunge straight into another exciting hymn, uh, uh, indicate that that's your preference. Hallelujah, Richard! Looks like we're on. Good job. Let's uh, let's once more let's stand and with with vigor and joy let's let's uh, let's declare. Guide me, O thy great Jehovah.
is indeed the correct response to singing that hymn on any occasion. Thank you very much. Um, I believe there was mention of tea earlier. Do feel free to stay and enjoy. There's a committee meeting uh, that, uh, that, that you need to have. So all your members of that grab each other in a, in a, in a friendly fashion and have a, have a meeting. And now may the love of God be the passion in your heart. May the joy of God give you strength when times are hard. May the presence of God fill you with a peace that overflows and is beyond understanding. And may the words of God be in you, the seeds that you might sow in those who cross your path this week. Amen. Amen.